What you're about to see is a video that was put together with the help of our friends from the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. It's an incredible video that goes into the life stories of members of the Chicago Fire Department who have been involved with serious injury or death on this job. I thank you for the time you're gonna to devote to watch this video, and remember, everyone goes home. No one should have to experience the tragic families, the loss. It never goes away. You understand it, it happens, but it doesn't go away. Standing shoulder to shoulder with greatness can be a once in a lifetime opportunity. But in the past, Greatness has come at a great price. Now, in the Windy City, change is in the air. This is the greatest job in the world because you can help people, you can save lives, you can save property. You're out there helping people that are down on their worst day of their life. But in order to do that, we have to stay safe. Safety is everyone's responsibility. From the moment you walk in the firehouse in the morning to the moment you leave the following morning, it is everyone's responsibility. From the candidate all the way up to the fire commissioner, if somebody on the fire ground sees something that is not safe, he or she has a duty to report it. Every officer in the job will tell you that the safety of his crew is the most important thing to him. Give me five things you're gonna do on your next shift to guarantee that that's gonna happen. And that's the difference. What I want you to remember is, if you're not sure, ask. If you're not prepared, you have to learn. We have to learn about buildings, we have to learn about construction, we have to learn about fire behavior. Don't come to work and be complacent. Come to work and keep learning. The day you stop learning on this job is the day you should retire. Train, train, train trained the way you're going to play. I don't know how else to, to say this. Nothing beats training. My husband told me a great story the other day. He said, Kyle, when I'm driving the engine and I'm looking in the rear view mirror, I see all four guys sitting in the cab waiting for me to get to where we're supposed to go. And I don't ever want to have to look Johnny at the funeral home saying, I didn't get your father there safely. You can rescue somebody just as easy by telling them to buckle their suit belt as you can by throwing them over your shoulder and carrying them out the building. That's rescue enough. I'll be honest with you, um, be before Billy Grant was killed, and uh, I never wore a seatbelt on a fire truck, never. But I wear my seatbelt every time I get on the fire truck to this day. And that's the guy's honest truth. Seeing him getting loaded in the ambulance, seeing Jerry Cambria getting pulled away, seeing McSwain get pulled off, seeing Billy Grant underneath the rig. I mean, that'll stick in your craw, big time. So, you put your belt down, see it won't happen to you. In 1982, LC's dream came true when he was hired by the Chicago Fire Department. But that dream was cut short April the 29th of 2000 when he was killed in the line of duty. We were traveling northbound on 107th and Troop. The lights and sirens horn, which is very loud. We had a civilian <clears throat> who decided to ignore everything and try to beat us across the intersection. At that point, that's where we had a collision. Elsie <laughs> Merrill was ejected out of the truck. We ran back to the corner looking for Elsie Merrill, which <clears throat> hmm. which is where we found him he was he had perished at the time there was a third vehicle that had a woman and two children in it they had their seat belts on their vehicle was knocked into a prairie where they were found sitting in their seat belt safely 
At that point, everybody was taken to the hospital where Lieutenant L.C. Merrill was pronounced dead. It was so sudden. You know, we had just saw, saw him going to work, and then a few hours later, you know, you're called to come to the hospital. Safety is first, above everything. You will never know what the outcome could have been, but L.C. did not have a seatbelt on. So my plea today is safety first. I know when uh, firefighters and service personnel are out there trying to help and do their job, you know, they're in a rush and in a hurry to make that move, but safety first and buckle up. Most, most important is that we all go home. We're not supermen. We have families that's, that, uh, that need you too, so. We have other obligations as well. You gotta understand in our job, the, the environment we work in, from the buildings, the street, um, all, all the unknowns that we deal with, the one factor that they never consider when they're designing this stuff and they're building it and they're testing it is us and fire. We have so many different types of structures in the city of Chicago. We have new construction, we have lightweight construction, we have steel bar joists, we have old construction, which are bowstring truss roofs. We have our ordinary constructed buildings, which still kill our firefighters. We rush into buildings because we know we have 20 minutes, 30 minutes of fire time on the floor. But if we don't understand that new building construction now, we can't rush into these buildings. If we recognize that it's a new construction and understand that there's a structural fire and we're running in there, we're gonna lose guys. We can't tactically attack a fire like we did in 1970 because the enemy has changed. Buildings are built lighter, they're built cost effective, not life effective. So their collapse probability is at a much higher rate and fires burn much hotter. We all know that in a balloon frame building, if the fire is blowing out the attic window, the first place we look is in the basement. But what we sometimes don't understand is those same lessons apply to all buildings. You can learn those same kind of lessons about ordinary construction, about lightweight construction, about high-rise buildings. Uh, the same kind of lessons apply, right? How is this building gonna kill me? I think the key to all this is situational awareness, knowing where you're at. I mean, there's times in a fire building, you're up and down the stairs, you lose track of actually what floor you're on sometimes. When the stuff hits the fan, you, you've got to know where you're at. Take the minute and do your own size up. Look where the windows are at. Look where the doors are at. It's on you when you get in there. Talk to the older guys that have been through a lot more of this, and you'll get a lot, lot more knowledge. They all think they're gung-ho when they're young. What you learn in later life, you got to respect that fire. When you're a young kid, you got that cape on. You want to go through walls. And if you don't have the old timers, they'll kind of pull you back a little bit, say, hold on, kid, understand what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing, and to give yourself a way out. We can't look at what we see right now. If you want to make things go right, you have to think about what's going to happen next. You should know where that fire is going next. I mean, what you're seeing is, is fine and dandy when you're trying to put that out, but it's going somewhere, and you, you should know where, that's, where it's going and the actions you should be taking to keep yourself safe. We have to learn from our mistakes. As we arrived on the scene, uh, the building that was involved was totally involved, and the incident commander, the chief, told uh, the officer to tell two guys to go next door to the building that was they had a little exposure to it. By this time, in the front of the building, a lot of that baffle board had come down. And now me thinking that this, this smoke and heat is not lifting. Obviously, the guys didn't get enough time to open up a hole in the roof yet to let the heat exa gases escape. I realized there was a, that air conditioner in the front because I had been through there. I got to get that out. With this, my bell goes off in my tank. I breathe heavily. I was exhausted, it was a warm night. I got this air conditioner, mistake number one. So as I was getting that air conditioner out, for some reason I felt something wasn't right. And it was in a few seconds that I ran out of air. And I ran out of air right now. 
that mess sucked on me right now. With that, I had to pull it off because I couldn't breathe. As I pulled off on it, the heat and the gases got to me. I went smack on the ground. All I knew is I had no air and I was terrified. It took me about maybe just a few seconds to go through that room and to find that stairway going down. I dove into that stairwell and I went straight down. I went back up afterwards when overhauling was all done and the guy stripped everything out. When I went back up to that room up there, I couldn't believe that that 15 feet that I was from that stairwell, something like 15 miles to me. It's one thing if we want to do a John Wayne and there's people trapped, we do that extra more. That's what we do. I knew there was nothing up there. There was no reason for me to go to get that air conditioner out when that tank was going on. We can overextend ourselves, understand your time frame, understand your body, what you can and can't do, understand the heat conditions, understand the weather conditions. I pushed the limit. With 28 years on, I've done this many times, but I pushed the envelope this one day. If something happened, I would have left my wife and four kids without a dad. Holy cripes. And uh, that, that's my story. As far as calling the Mayday on the scene of a fire or an incident, it's important to me that if a firefighter or paramedic thinks they're in trouble, they are in trouble. We need to have them call a Mayday. It's not about embarrassments, it's about your life. To get the cavalry coming early is a much better deal than having to explain to your wife why, why we're here today. A, a Mayday should be a, a routine distress signal, okay? An airline pilot, a ship's captain, doesn't call a Mayday in a panic. He calls a mayday because he needs help, and he recognizes that he needs help, and the, and the resources he has on hand aren't going to solve his problem. When you find yourself in a situation where the resources you have on hand aren't going to solve your problem, your air supply is low, you're disoriented, you're lost, you're involved in the middle of a collapse, sudden fire growth, you call the mayday. You're asking for help. You're bringing in additional resources to help you solve your problem. That's all it is. If you don't start them in early enough, they might not get you in, like I said. We'll be explaining to your wife or your daddy or my. I know this guy's missing. I've got a radio right here. And I never went like this and said, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. It was in the late evening. It was bitter cold, probably 20 below zero. Uh, I was a uh, second truck. Uh, they held the roof, uh, assuming that, you know, we had the fire under control. The chief ordered Reed and I to go in the, the building and do a search, which we did. We didn't know at the time, but they'd already pulled the woman out of the kitchen in a full cardiac arrest, and they were working her. Everyone on the scene didn't wasn't aware of that, so we were still in the process of trying to find the 78-year-old woman that was there. The smoke cleared. By the time we got to the back bedroom, you could actually turn around and look out the front of the building. I had a thermal imaging camera with me that didn't show anything. We thought we had it out, and we didn't. The smoke started banking down, and the uh, guy started yelling, and the air horn started going off, and everybody bailed out. The fire was waiting for some cold, cold, cold air, and at that time it just flashed over, and the, the, the whole structure was literally a fireball. My choices were to get burnt alive or to, to go face down and think about what I was going to do. And everybody's out front, and, and the chief says, you have everybody. I'm looking around, and I can't find Reed. It was a very, very sinking feeling. By this time, the flames are blowing out all the windows on the second floor. I was convinced he was dead. The, one of the mistakes that I made uh, is I didn't call Mayday. Uh, I, I should have said Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. I didn't. I was assuming that Mayday was already called. All of a sudden, I, I get a, a weak voice on my radio. Uh, Truck 45, roof to truck 45, like, where are you at? I'm in front of the building. I'm still in the building. Well, we had 20 guys bail out the front. So I'm looking around at guys. One of the lieutenants was assuming that is when I said I was in front of the building, that I was out of the building, in front of the building. If I would have said mayday, 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 I would have been in the building. So Reed's trying to bang his way out the door and we got up there with the chief and a couple other guys and he yanked that door open and grabbed him. He had curtains and electrical cords tangled around him. Before you react, think about it. One of the things you might accomplish is you might come out in a body bag, you know. I had a 
full cardiac arrest. I was very fortunate to be around the right people at the right time. The building engineer explained to us that we had a fire on 12, we had somebody trapped, and the elevators were out of service. As always, our job, we took the stairs, extinguished the fire, uh, did our search and rescue, and uh, ventilated. I went to the Deputy Fire Commissioner and reported to him what we found and what, what we just did. Uh, at that time, I remember getting lightheaded and dizzy. I was hoping there was a bench behind him. I was hoping to make, the, make it to the bench behind him and take a breather. Didn't happen. I was dead by the time I hit the floor. I, I fell in his arms. Um, so fortunate enough that where I was and the talent and the people I had around me, that's why I'm sitting here talking. 20 years in a fire department, I probably should have pushed myself away from the kitchen table a little more than I did. When I came out of the fire department, I was 170 pounds soaking wet. I was all the way up to 250. Unfortunately for us, there's a good cook in every firehouse. And what we have to start doing is watching what we eat and working out a little better and pushing ourselves away from the table a little more so we stay in better shape. I was in the hospital and out rehab and what was going through my mind is that I might not go back. And that broke my heart even more, not going back to the fire department. 50% of line of duty deaths are from heart attacks, still. We have to be fit. Uh, there's probably three major areas that we can prevent heart attacks from occurring. Number one, see a doctor. Go to a doctor every year and, and do what that doctor tells you to do. Take the medications that are prescribed. Uh, lose the weight that the doctor tells you to lose. Next, we want to eat right. Make sure that we're eating the proper foods. Lastly, we need to work out. We need to be involved in a physical fitness program. We need to exercise that, that big muscle, the heart. Local 2, two years ago, had a test that they were offering. It was a heart scan. I figured there was nothing wrong with me. I was in great shape. Watch my diet, not smoker. So I went. They did find that there was something wrong with me, something that was undetected by any other test. After the test, I was really in disbelief that anything like this could ever happen to me. I was in really good shape. I had no signs or symptoms. I felt really good. And I would definitely tell my brother firefighters, when the opportunity comes, there's a chance for you to take a test. Do not hesitate, take it. It could save your life, it saved mine. Setting good habits and starting good habits start with the company officer every day at work to teach your firefighters and paramedics to be game ready when you pull out the door. Equipment is so important. I know personally from being burned over 30% of my body and spending 21 days in the burn unit that you have to have all your equipment on in order to be safe. And that's not a given that you're gonna come out alive. But the first step is to make sure you wear your equipment, you know your equipment, and you know its limitations. Right when I had that wall crumbled and that room blew, uh, that's the first thing that goes through your head is this, this is not happening to me. I was a fire call for basement fire. 84th and Carpenter it was 15, 15 below that day. It was really cold. So I let out to the rear. We're getting ready to go in. We had all our gear on. And uh, I was just, I remember thinking how I was hungry. It was a Sunday morning. So that's when I said, I, I can knock this in 10 minutes and overhaul in 15 and, and we'll be back eating breakfast. And uh, so we let out. It was bad in there. It was bad. And uh, I mean, brown all the way down to the ground. So and we went in 15, 20, 15, 20 feet. And uh, I thought I had it knocked. My officer informed me that we're on our fourth hydrant, frozen hydrants. It's, it's pretty common. And uh, we had about 50 gallons left, so we got to get out of here. I thought I had it. So I stood up, and I, I, I knew we didn't have it. I turned to the right and I had actually hit a lolly column with my head which knocked my helmet off and pulled my pulled my mask off my face to the side. I got turned around and I was going towards what I thought was the exit. I actually thought it was a door and it wasn't a door. I actually just walked right through the wall. That's how long it had been cooking. Right when I walked in the, through that wall, boom, uh, just went. I was amazed how a person who was half out of it, how with that pipe you, you can find your way out. I mean, from behind a wall and a zigzag and, and a good 20 feet. So uh, yeah, we made it. So uh, I was extremely happy about that. I remember thinking if I wasn't geared up, especially if I didn't have my hood on, 
how much worse it could have been. For some reason that day, I, my son was really running through my head, my seven-year-old little guy. And I really hadn't seen my face yet until later when my wife showed me pictures and, and you're being rolled in and there's 40 people waiting for you and you're up there staring at you like, boy, this, this doesn't look good. So and then I was put on a table and that's when I heard the word intubate. And I'm not a paramedic or an EMT, but I, I know what intubate means. And uh, that's when I told the doctor, you know what, just put me in a car and take me home. I want to see my family. So uh, uh, that was the last thought. And uh, I woke up about three days later. Still hungry, so very hungry. And the bottom line is you, you have to be ready for any fire even if you are going a lot of fires, because uh, I was ready with all my gear on and, and, it's, and I still got hurt. So you definitely have to be aware and ready and always looking at your surroundings and building conditions. If you think you got some good reason for not wearing this or for not doing things the right way, write it down, because I need to read that to your widow, because I'm not gonna know what to say. You say it for me. The thing about the three-story frame that we've been taught through training was the balloon construction part. The part that when there is a fire in the basement, how fast it can travel to the third floor and to the, the uh, uh, attic area, the unexposed areas, the areas you may not be able to see. That was the part of this fire that took us by surprise as our uh, first end company. We were noticing some of the bays up in the first floor were showing flame. We were hitting those bays and knocking them down uh, and at that point, it looked like we had the fire knocked. I wanted to go down the back staircase to see how well that second company was doing in the basement. The windows were open, people were taking their masks off. It looked like it was a well-knocked fire. After checking in the basement, I got up the back staircase, ran to the second floor, looked in. There was no sign of fire on the second floor. I went up to that third floor apartment. As I determined no fire on the third floor, I heard a call on the radio for a search of the second and third floors. Tom went up to do some recon, thinking the conditions were a little better than they were, left his troops down in the first floor, went up and, and got himself in a real bad predicament. Because I was already there on the third floor, I decided to stick for, stay up there with the search. When realizing that this was the only occupied floor of that building, I was concerned in regards that there may still be an occupant upstairs or the chief had knowledge that there was still someone in that apartment. I found the bedroom, I found a TV on. These things were still fairly visible to me. Uh, one of the things I always remembered from training is you make a window a door. While I was at the front window, I pushed the front windows completely out and uh, cleaned it out and I was on my way back to go back down the staircase that I had come up. As I hit that back kitchen area, I saw a large volume of fire coming out blocking that back door from me going through. And over the radio, I hear Tom's voice, uh, no real urgency, saying, uh, engine 62 to battalion 22, we have fire in the attic. I had communications with the battalion chief to let him know that it was me up there and that what I would need is a ladder to the third floor window. As I hit that front window, uh, little did I know that the amount of uh, smoke in uh, heat that was building up. And I'm looking up towards the front of the building, turning the corner, and I'm about to answer him that I know that the attic's lighting up, and I, I see Tom 32 feet above ground in this small little window with this churning black smoke surrounding him. As I hit that front window, I, was, I wanted to be sure of my communications with the chief because I had realized from radio communication, his voice was changing. There was something dramatic going on, I didn't know about. Sometimes you're so in tight that you, you can't see what's surrounding you. And I, I could see the terrible pre predicament he was in more so than he did. I'm yelling on the radio, Tommy come out, Tommy come out, lay it in, lay it in. They, they dropped this ladder in. The ladder got raised, I kicked my feet out of the window, went down the ladder. When I got down is when I began to realize uh, the amount of fire and uh, flame that was that that had surrounded me up in that window however i never felt any of it all having all the ppe in in order and and wearing it all properly people looked at me like you don't belong here you're sure you're not hurt a lot of people later on told me they thought i had perished 
that bothered me more than anything that people I work with on a daily basis good friends with go to and from every day to think that I had passed and they were down there watching it that upset me the most uh, and and then of course thinking of my wife and five children and five grandchildren I uh, I realized that day the importance of wearing that PPE you know uh, a couple days later I was at Tom's daughter's wedding and uh, it was probably more emotional for me than it was for Tommy because uh, I knew how close it was to not happening. Sometimes in our job we become complacent because we think things are routine. There is no such thing as a routine fire. There's no such thing as a routine EMS call. We have to be in our game every time we pull out the door. Something I don't ever want to see again in my career is one of my members uh, on fire, you know, running from an incident. This particular incident, we had a 20-yard construction dumpster, and it was up against a school that they were doing some rehab work on. And the back of the dumpster was open, so therefore we couldn't fill it up. So we uh, decided out we had to uh, pull an inch and a half line, let out, but still nobody got dressed. It was hot. I had walked around to the front of the dumpster and they sent the water and everything all of a sudden just changed. There was a, a, a huge explosion. You know, it knocked me to the ground and uh, it caught everybody off guard. And as I got up, it just seemed like everything was going in slow motion. And Don was uh, a 34 year member. He's been to thousands of fires. He was on the busiest engine company in the city of Chicago for his whole career and was put off the job on a, on a routine rubbish fire. People are throwing away a lot more hazardous materials today than ever before. There's no such thing as a routine incident anymore. We have to respond, we have to be ready for the unexpected. That's our job as professionals. I don't drive anymore. It just, uh, I just, I just can't do it. It was uh, late March of, uh... Oh, seven. That morning, um, I decided to take a different route to work. And we were responding to a EMS Plan 1 from Quarters at uh, 59th on 59th Street. The light turned green. I was probably three quarters of the way through the intersection, and I got tagged by a bus. I looked up and I saw one of our fire trucks literally toppling over. The truck slid around and it tipped over. I wasn't for sure if I was actually seeing what I thought I was seeing. As we um, came over the expressway, we saw a truck, truck 51, on its side, and there were members inside of it. They were pretty banged up. You could see the, the tension in the air. You could just, you, know, you could see it as you were pulling up on the scene. When we hit the post, my hand went through the dashboard and just about cut my hand off. The truck was pretty mangled. So I literally had to climb up onto the truck to try to look in to see. I was talking with the officer and just, uh, so he was alive, he was talking to me, he was very bloody. He was telling me that, you know, how many guys he had on the truck and I told him it's gonna be okay, the help was coming. You were directed to uh, pull the ambulance up on the east side of the incident and pull our stretcher out. I was giving them the details, but I was telling them that I think we were missing one other person. I saw just a piece of a fire coat coming from under the truck. We could see that there was a member in there, and uh, they were trying to get the, uh, the apparatus up, uh, I think with some cribbing and maybe some airbags, anything. I remember hearing people calling for you know, a heavy wrecker, all kinds of stuff. Bring a stretcher over, you know, backboard collar so we could package him and get him ready, take him to a trauma center. I can remember just, you know, uh, over my whole career not really having my heart, feel my heart beat fast, you know. Uh, I can feel my, remember feeling my heart just going. Billy was still under the rig, you know, when I got there. And Squad was working on getting him out. And, and, and everybody, it was just, I mean, I'll never forget it. It was just so somber. So they got the truck up, and, um, and it was uh, Billy. I can't explain how much I wanted to help her. And I felt useless. I just felt like I was supposed to do something to help him, and I couldn't. 
I wouldn't wish that on anybody else to see, have to see something like that. In my 31 years of being on this job, I've seen 45 badges go on the wall at the academy. That means 45 members had line of duty deaths, and it's something I don't want to see any more of. We don't have any more room for badges on the wall. Knocking on a family member's door or greeting them at the ER is certainly nothing that I ever want to experience again. Nothing prepares you for the pain and the sorrow that follows. The sheer panic of the hope that he's okay and you're at the door and you know that he's not. And have a wife turn to you and look at you and say, what the hell happened here? Where the hell was this hood? Who was in charge? How'd you guys let this happen to him? Why him? What do I say to that? I think the worst day I've ever had in my life is when I was five years old and my father was killed in line of duty. Um, that day stays with me forever. It's like it happened yesterday. I don't want anyone else to have to go through that. And I don't speak just for myself. I speak for my family. I speak for the firefighters that worked with my father, that were next to him when he got killed. It never leaves you. It's a scar you'll always have. You can't fathom that feeling of loss, of what it is like to lose your hero, your father, in the line of duty. We were preparing to go to my sister's house for a Super Bowl party and the doorbell rang. And when I looked out the door, I saw this kindly looking elderly gentleman and he had the readily recognized Chicago Fire Department patch on his sleeve. He must have been harmless. So I opened the door and Allison was there with me. And as soon as he said what his name was, I said, you're not here for that, are you? And he was. Remember, my mother opened the door, and as the chaplain began to speak, I, I recall yelling out, no. I wanted to know what happened. And that's what I said to him. What, what happened? What could have gone wrong? I thought he knew what he was doing. Remember that nearly all line of duty injury and fatalities are preventable. My father's death was preventable. There's no need for your family to go through the pain that we went through. Each and every day I wish that doorbell had never rang. Gentlemen, I have a direct order for you today. At the end of today's shift, everyone goes home. Yes, sir! We pin that badge on the wall and we look at the family right in the eye and we say, we're never going to forget. Well, how do you never forget? What does that mean, to not forget? There's 466 of them up on that wall. And uh, they're all asking you to do the right thing. So do it. No firefighter comes to work thinking that there's ever a possibility that that could be their badge. Well, that's the way each of those guys felt on that day. Know your job. Be prepared when you come to work. When you pull out the door, make sure you don't think of anything as routine. Be ready to go to work. Take care of yourself. Practice. Practice the art of being a firefighter. You have to have respect for it. When you think you're on the top of your game and you think you're really good at it, it will humble you. Don't ever take anything for granted. If you do it, it will kill you. If you execute the basics to the fullest, we all go home. There's only one thing that's important to me, and that's that you get home at the end of the day. We can honor the men and women firefighters that have come before us with being the best firefighters that we can be. It's training. It's watching out for each other. We are our own keepers. Everything that we do, we have to do as if our life depends on it because it truly does. You all know me. You know what I do. But what you don't know is that I carry a terrible burden. And that is that I have to be the one to notify the ones you love should something happen to you. Please, please take that burden away from me. Remember, courage in the face of danger means everyone goes home. It's great to have a job where we can help people every day. But sometimes that life we need to save is ours. 
If you think you're going to need a Mayday, call a Mayday because it's going to save your life. Be careful out there because it only takes one situation to change your life completely or worse. Stay in a training because that's what keeps you safe. Stay in shape and stay on the job. Our profession is one that can go from mundane to catastrophic in the blink of an eye. We have to do everything in our power to make sure that everyone goes home. As a Chicago firefighter, the most important thing for me is to get home to my family every morning. You wear your PPE and you will too. Train, fight against complacency, work together because this job can kill you. Slow down, stop at red lights, wear your seatbelt, and wear your PPE the way it's intended. And be safe out there. Please take care of yourself and take care of each other so that everyone goes home. Buckle your seatbelt so that your family does not have to go through what my family went through. My dad's death was preventable. Please do what you have to do to come home safe. Please come to work prepared and never be complacent. Have respect for this thing. Watch out for each other. Get home safe. The feeling I get when I walk into a firehouse in the city of Chicago is nothing but pride. Pride in the people that work there, pride in the city that I've grown up in and I love. It's the greatest job in the world and it's the best department in the world. Oh, we come to play. Fire Department Chicago boys. Yeah, they'll drop some holes in there. When that bell rang, whatever we was talking about, it's over with. It's time to go to work. The greatest collection of characters that any movie could assemble. Characters? You bet. Love them all. This is a family. It's a family that most families don't even understand. I think that it's the greatest job in the face of the earth, bar none. It's the best job in the world, and that's why everybody's fighting to get here. When you tell somebody you're a Chicago firefighter, eyes light up. My children are very proud of me. My wife is very proud of me. We have to live up to the standard of the men before us. You better have some pride and you better maintain the dignity of your company because it means something. No sane person goes into a burning building, you know, except for us, Chicago firefighters, but this is what we do as a tradition. We are full of pride and tradition and history. Oh man, oh, I wanted this job ever since I was a little kid. It's a powerful, powerful group of people. It's a culture of service. It's a culture of dedication. It starts the night before when you have that thrill of going to bed and I'm going to the firehouse tomorrow. There are people that are going to put their life on the line for total strangers. They're going to crawl hallways uh, that other people would sell their soul to escape. I think we're second to none. When we pull out the door, we take care of each other, and that's number one. Very proud of them. Proud to be one.